Hey everyone, this is Objective 101. Students will be able to multiply and divide integers. Now, if you look at this first table, this is just showing the different ways that we can multiply and divide. Now, the most common way that you've seen throughout your math career is just 10 times 5. I'm using 10 and 5 for these examples, just the numbers I chose. But usually you see multiplication represented as a number, and then a little x representing multiplication times 5. We're going to use the next one a lot more often, like 10.5. That's also another way to show multiplication. The reason we'll use that a lot more frequently in Algebra 1 is because we use x as a variable very often, and that can be confusing if we have like x times something. So we try to usually avoid using that time symbol like you did in your middle school days. Another way we can show multiplication is with parentheses. So you see that 10 is outside of the parentheses, which are around 5. That's saying 10, parentheses 5, which is really saying 10 times 5. So that's another way we can show multiplication. And then last, we can actually have parentheses around both of the numbers. So parentheses 10, and then also parentheses 5. That's saying 10 times 5. If you look back to that third example, we could have had the parentheses just around the 10 and had the 5 outside of those parentheses, that would be totally okay. There's actually one more way we can show multiplication. I'm going to give you a second to think about it. It's a clever way we can show multiplication. The last way we can show it is as an exponent. 10 to the fifth power, so 10 is the base, and the tiny number up top, that's the exponent. That's saying 10 to the fifth power. What it's really saying is 10 multiplied by itself five times. So 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 and times 10. That's another way we can show multiplication. Now thinking of ways we can show division, again, we'll start with the most basic way, just 10 divided by 5, that division sign you've seen throughout your entire math career. We can also do 10 dash 5, so kind of a slash. That's also representing division. And then as a fraction. We could say it as 10 over 5, but we want to focus a lot on not losing that operation because a fraction is division. So that's saying 10 divided by 5. So every time you see a fraction, keep in mind that that really is telling you to divide. And then last way we could represent it is as long division, as 10 kind of inside the house or inside the box, and then being divided by 5. Those are all the different ways we can represent multiplication and division. Now let's take a peek down at the face. Get it? It's like a face. His name is Houdat. Notice how it's not a question mark. The statement. That creature's name is Houdat. And if you're ever wondering why, well, just take a listen. That's because... Um, when we were thinking about naming him, I say we, Miss Hyder, myself. We thought about naming it Houdat, and she started cracking up. And every time it's mentioned now, she cracks up. And so it just stuck. The cool thing about Houdat is he's actually very useful in helping us multiply and divide integers. So let's say, for example, you were trying to multiply a negative and a positive. You could use Houdat and just cover up one negative and one positive. And when you do that, notice what's left over. Well, you have a negative left over. That's because a negative times a positive equals a negative. Same thing is true about division. Houdat works for multiplying and dividing positive and negative numbers. Now let's say that you had a positive times a negative. You would just cover those up and look at what's left. Well, you have a negative left over. That's because a positive number times a negative number is a negative. Now let's say we had two negatives being multiplied by each other. Well, just cover both those up and notice what's left over. The positive left over. That's because a negative times a negative is a positive. And the last one is not really represented here, but Huda assumes that you know a positive times a positive is still a positive. That's the kind of multiplying and dividing you've been doing for a while now. Okay? So let's head down to the guided practice. My suggestion whenever you're multiplying and dividing positive negatives is just to worry about the numbers first. So look at number one. We have three times negative three. 
I would kind of ignore all the positive and negatives and just do 3 times 3. 3 times 3 is 9. Pretty simple. Now look back to the values and recognize we had a positive and a negative. So if we look at up here with a positive and a negative, well, that's going to be a negative value. So our final answer for 3 times negative 3 is a negative 9. Let's move on to number 2. We have 11 times negative 5. Again, I would just worry about the numbers first. 11 times 5 is 55. Now look back to the values. You had a positive 11 and negative 5, and a positive times a negative is negative. So the entire answer is negative 55. Number 3, 36 divided by 4 is 9. But notice how the actual problem is negative 36 divided by 4. So we have a negative and a positive involved. That means our final answer is going to be negative 9. Looking now at number 4, similar situation. We have negative 12 divided by 3. Focus just on the numbers first. Negative 12 divided by 3 That's going to be 4. But notice how it's a negative 12 divided by 3, so your final answer is going to be negative 4. And number 5, we actually have multiple numbers being multiplied together. Take it step by step. Start with 3 times negative 15. Well, 3 times 15 is 45, and now I'm basically making sure that I have the right sign. I had a positive 3 and a negative 15. If you were to cover up a positive and a negative, you'd be left with a negative, so it's negative 45. Now we do negative 45 times 2. If we focus just on the numbers, 45 times 2 is 90, and then just make sure we have the right sign. We had a negative times a positive. That's going to end up being a negative, so our final answer is negative 90. Similar steps for number 6. Focus on, it's negative 8 times negative 5 times 4, but let's just focus on the first part, negative 8 times negative 5. To start, I'm just going to do 8 times 5. That's 40. Now we had a negative times a negative, and that's going to be a positive, so I can just leave it as 40. Now I have 40 times 4, which is going to be 160, and that's my final answer for number 6. At this point in time, go ahead and pause the video, finish these three, and then finish all of the independent practice on the next page. When you feel like you're comfortable and you got it checked, go ahead and unpause the video and see how you did. One key point to add on this page, when you're multiplying negatives, if you ever have an even number of negatives, like number 9, you have 4 negatives there. So if you have 2 negatives, 4 negatives, 6 negatives, so on and so forth, if you have an even number of negatives, your answer will always be positive. Same idea if you had an odd number of negatives, if you had 1 negative, 3 negative, 5 negatives, your answer would always be negative. That's a key point you definitely should have down because it's going to be helpful in the future. All right, let's check our work on page two. Before we move on to any of the, the word problems, I want to mention, you should always check these on your calculator. It should be the tool you use the most on these because why not? It, it's easier. It's quicker. At this point in time, like we're, we're trying to develop the basics, the background, that should always be your first go-to and check. Now I'm going to go over number 14 together with us. Make sure you do all the rest for homework and come prepare for class with all this objective done. Now before I just hop into it, I want to remember our annotation strategy, which is cuss. That's going to help us properly annotate the problems so we can make sure we're actually answering what it's asking for. Again, a lot of students just hop in and start reading we are suggesting that go straight to that question, okay? We're going to go ahead and circle that question so we know what we're trying to answer. So we're trying to figure out how many total meals should you pack. So read the question, we're good there. Now we're going to underline stuff that's going to help us answer that question of, okay, how many meals should you pack? Saying you go hiking with five friends for four days, sounds important, might help me figure out how many meals to pack, and you're in charge of bringing the food. If you plan to eat three meals each day, Again, how many total meals should you pack? So now we've underlined what we think is the important information. Let's go ahead and try to solve. Now what a lot of students do here is they're like, okay, I have five friends, and we're going to eat three meals per day. So do five times three, and they get 15. And they're like, okay, 15 meals per day. I'm going to be there for four days. 15 times four is 60. There's an error in that process. 
Take a second and see if you can figure it out. You forgot something very important. You forgot yourself. It's saying you go hiking with five friends. So that's you plus your five friends. So really there are six people in total. So if you want to make sure you have enough meals, you have to include yourself in that calculation. So what we should do first is maybe six times three. And that'll give us an idea of how many meals we're going to eat each day. And then 18 times 4 gives me a total of 72 meals. Now, some students ask, could I have just done like 6 times 4 times 3? Well, try that. See if you get the same value and then ask yourself, like, what is that really saying? So we've solved. The last part is now a quick sanity check. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. 72 meals per day makes sense. Like, we need to have plenty of food for the six of us. You might want to think as well like of adding an extra S to your CUS acronym because the last thing for all word problems is we expect you to have your answer in a full sentence. So that extra S might remind you, okay, do I actually have a full sentence answer? Because if you left it like this, you can only earn partial credit. So your final answer should look like, I should pack 72 meals, or I should pack 72 meals for four days. Those would be acceptable, complete final answers. All right, make sure you go ahead and finish the rest on your own. I want to highlight number two. Definitely not going to go through it with you. This is a really tough one. It's probably the most asked problem on this objective. You all can totally figure this out. It gives you the hint of drawing a picture. might be helpful. But again, start with that CUS acronym. Make sure you're actually answering the question. Because a lot of students do some great math, but they don't answer the question here. All right, we will see you guys tomorrow.